and a happy festive post Michigan State weekend to you, Mike the Mailman. Oh, thank you very much. What a game. What a game. I like your hat, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I'm obviously in the holiday spirit yes, you after are. that game. Yes, you are. Yeah. As you should be. <laughs> As you should be. Uh, I got to find something to yeah, be happy right. about. Yeah, right. Absolutely. To right. be jolly about. Stuffed our faces this in you know, the last weekend for Thanksgiving and lost the football game in the snow. I did like the camouflage uniforms, though. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't so camouflage in person, trust me. <laughs> I thought it was cool on TV how you couldn't see the... Oh, yeah. I the know. Penn State players. I know. Be like a safety out there somewhere. I still can't I feel my face or my <laughs> hands or my toes. <laughs> I was warm and cozy, man. I, I, uh, but miserable at the same time. Well, good news, Kevin. You can warm yourself by the fire here at Mount Nittany Winery, and you all can grab your pencil and your paper because this is the obligatory PSU pregame show. Welcome back, everybody, to the obligatory PSU pregame show. Happy holidays to you. We are here this week at a cool new space that wasn't even here when we did our little walkthrough, yes. which you all get to see later. This is the Vintner's Loft. Well done. Mm. At the Mount Nittany Vineyard and Winery. Mm -hmm. I like to call it the Tasting Grotto. Yes. I think maybe yeah, yeah. I'm going to suggest when, that. When we're in here, it's name. probably a Tasting Grotto. Yeah, yes. yeah, yes. Grotto, Loft, yeah. whatever. <laughs> it's a cool spot it's right cool. on the side of, with all due respect to the Nittany Lion, the other symbol of our best, Mount Nittany. I'm your fake host, Chris Bucanani, and I got the whole crew here to celebrate the ignominious end of Penn State's 2021 regular football season. I got the love campus like on Mike, the mailman. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's, it's, it's over already? They have a bowl game yet, right? Uh, mercifully, oh, it's, mercifully, it's mostly <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Former Penn State and NFL defensive tackle, Brandon Noble. Cheers. You enjoying that tailgate red? I am enjoying the tailgate good. red. A little different, a little, little wine today as opposed to beer or coffee as we had last week. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so it's Mixing good. It's it a nice little change of pace to, to finish things off. Try it. Yeah, we're going to need it to yes. talk about that game. Yes. And last but not least, former OnwardState.com managing editor Kevin Horn, you were at that mess in the snow last week. I was there, man. I hate that place. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have had some rough adventures with the results on the field and the weather. What you call the, the Mark D'Antonio weather machine? Yeah. That was yeah. Awesome. yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's it, you always, I've, never, I've been to uh, East Lansing probably five or six times. I have never seen the sunshine on a Saturday. <laughs> Sunday. I woke up, it was nice out. Saturday, it will always be weather. Always, always, always. And it always plays to the uh, Michigan State strength. So losing to Ohio State, I don't like, but I can understand. Mm -hmm. Losing to Michigan, super frustrating, but at least e equivalent talent, if you believe well, and you the look recruiting what, look services. Look how they worked. Things worked out for Michigan this yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah week, exactly. Right, yeah. You lose to a team like Illinois, that's so comical. Yeah. I, I, like, I, I can at least rationalize it in an absurd kind of way. Understand. But there is nothing that drives me nuts more than losing to a team like Michigan State, which is a respectable program, but one that Penn State ought to be able to get over on. And like our other divisional rivals of note, James Franklin now has a losing record against Michigan State. Yeah, I mean, that, that game is going to, that's the way it's going to go. I mean, you knew that's the way. No matter what you predicted last weekend, that was the way it was going to go, obviously. Unfortunately. Yeah, you're right. Like, you know, it's funny because watching, watching the obligatory from last week, uh, Saturday morning, you know, I'd pop it on, and, and, uh, and I, I caught the random number generated, and I was like, I picked this to win. And I just wasn't feeling it. You know, I, I think I've been trying to be so positive about the season uh, that I – <laughs> that, that I, you know, I, I think that there's a part of you that knows going into that one mm -hmm. that it's, it could be bad. Well, that's what drives me nuts. I didn't know. I really felt, I think I said it when we were making our picks last week. I went with Penn State because I thought we were a little bit better team. And I had to believe that we would have a few games this year where being the better team was enough. And after watching yeah. the game, I still feel like we were the better team. Yeah, well, Chris, I mean, the, Penn State is Michigan this year. Michigan, playoff bound, likely playoff bound Michigan, except for 
the run game, except for a couple of pieces, yeah. Yeah. Haskins, and then their uh, their O line. Obviously, they have Aiden Hutchinson, right, which who is a, a, a game changer. But Penn State's DNs are good. Penn State wins all of their games, but maybe one yeah. Yeah. if they can run for four or five yards with any consistency whatsoever. Again, it came back to bite them. Yep. Last weekend in East Lansing, couldn't get pick up one yard. That is amazing. A couple times, like I don't even assume. Like usually, as a player, right when it's third and one or fourth and one, and you, my position, right, right over the ball, like there's in your head, you're like, this is a terrible down yeah, sure. to play defense. It's a terrible down to play defense, but there's always that slight glimmer of hope that someone's going to pop a gap, somebody's going to, you know, we're going to make the right call, and you're going to stop them. But realistically, in your head, you're going, we're going to first down. Well, and you watch tape, right? Yeah. So you saw 11 teams, including the Villanova Wildcats, do it against Penn State this season. Yeah. So you got to be feeling pretty it confident. Would, it, that's what I'm saying. Against the Nittany Lions, it would be a whole different animal. I would love for someone to crunch the numbers nationally, what the rate of success is on third or fourth and two or less yeah. versus Penn State, which has to be less than 50%, has to be. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's got to be just astounding. I almost prefer that it's like third and five, third mm-hmm. and six, so they're forced to throw, the, throw ball the ball versus third and, and fourth and one against even a team like Villanova. I mean, that's the story of the year, right? It's, it's, a, it it's a broken, dysfunctional team because of that one component, right? The defense is stout. Yep. The special teams, aside from Jordan Stout, kicking a field goal in any game that matters, is stout, no pun intended. And the offense is generally good, but for but, half wow. of the half of, the, of what you need, yeah. which is to I, run the ball. I, I, in my lifetime, I've probably been to like 1,500 or 2,000 basketball and football games, and I've watched coaches ice the foul shooter or the or oh, the field goal. I never saw a, a coach ice his own kicker. I no? never saw that. You've never seen that? No, and then he missed the field goal. I, 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 did I miss something, or did I walk away from the game, or what happened there? I, we just decided to compete 364 days. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's that's Saturday right. didn't yeah. count. Yeah. It's I, like uh, a leap year of competition. But <laughs> it, it, okay. and, I, and I was sort of numb to – I wanted to beat Michigan State because I, I hate – Going out there and losing, which seems to happen so often, every time. But yeah. one, we even won. We won out there once in like twelve years, right? Uh, we haven't been playing for a while, granted. But it's just a, it's an awful place to go. It's an awful place to watch Penn State lose. And um, th- this team, it's you know, it is the playoff team for the first three and a half games, and yeah. then all of a sudden one component goes down. Uh, and it's over, right? I mean, the Sean Clifford had like three times as many sacks taken in the second half of the year as the first half. Part of this is his schedule, and part of that is he's never been, he hasn't been 100% since those first couple weeks, which takes away the most important part of his game, which is the ability to scramble, ability to get out of, yep. of sacks, and when the snow's coming down, you know, it's even harder. And I thought, I mean, I thought the snow and the weather was going to benefit Penn State because Michigan's best aspect, Michigan State's best aspect, rather, is the run game. Mm -hmm. They have a Heisman candidate as a running back, but what we neglected to think about was that a poor tackling team becomes an awful tackling team when it's slippery, it's and, hard to and we him. saw we saw Brandon Smith have pr- potentially the worst game of his Penn State career yeah. among many bad games, yeah. and uh, in the offensive line, aside from the bright spot, Langdon uh, Tangawall seemed to hold up fairly well. Was again dreadful, and um, on and a that positive is note, I think coming into this year, it was questionable what Sean Clifford's legacy at Penn State was going to be yeah. and I think he's going to be remembered most for his toughness mm-hmm. and what may be one of the last plays we see from him in blue and white is going to be that fourth down conversion and yeah. I think that encapsulates the way Penn State fans are going to remember now, yeah. his career. that screwed up, screwed up the team total so I was upset that he had that last touchdown <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, but you're right. I, I was I was so pessimistic about Sean Clifford going in this year. He proved me wrong. He proved everyone wrong. That guy and I, this is, these are stupid football words. That guy fights. That guy's a fighter. Yep. To use a Bill O'Brien word, not great. I won't go that far. <laughs> but uh, but really, uh, kudos to him for proving everyone wrong. And and uh, really love, love that guy now. So we're going to revisit our season predictions Oof. on the other side of the break, guys. So yes. hang on for that. Might want to pour some more wine. Yes. Stay with us. We'll be back. Uh, they have a great team, offensively, defensively. I think 15 and 0 is not out of the, out of the possibility. I, I love, I love the Nittany Lions this year. I'm 10 and 2 as usual. Right? Oh, yeah. wow, that's good. I am. Look, I, I feel good about. It. I really, I do. We're not ready to beat Ohio State. We're not there, right? So that that's a get. But but what the problem is? One of the whether it's Wisconsin, Iowa, 
you know, one of those other ones, we're going to slip up, but I, but I think we win the rest. I can see 10 and two for sure. I Mike, the mailman total fall. They're all, I'm not even acknowledge you, <laughs> but I could see six and six, oh. man. It is just that kind of a team. And I'm, I'm going to stick with the 10 and two. Look, James Franklin has been here long enough. We know what he's about. I can't, I can't do it, right? I can't, I can't rely on the players developing as they do it in most programs, right? I can rely on the talent coming here. I cannot rely on the normal sort of progression of talent. That, we have not seen that happen at all. So I got to go eight and four. Okay. Well, some of us have more to apologize for than others. Welcome back, everybody. The obligatory PSU pregame show is here at Mountain Nittany Vineyard and Winery in State College. And Horn, you were the closest of the four of us, so I'm going to yeah. let you choose. Do you want to go last or you want to go first? I'll go first. Okay. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do is comment on your prediction, what went wrong, uh, what changed from what you expected. Maybe give everybody both... A reason for concern coming off a seven and five year, because none of us thought we'd be this bad, hmm. and give everybody a reason to hope going into the next year. I don't know about that last one. Um, Do your best. Regret- regrettably, I was closest to the number. I think I picked eight and four. I probably would have picked seven and five if I wasn't a wussy and worried about all the Twitter hate I would receive for doing that. But uh, yeah, I-, I was. Twitter would not give you credit now for being right. So it was no. a good decision. Correct. Well, I, I wasn't sure. really right because I was, I was the closest to the number for all the wrong reasons, right? <laughs> Before the season, I thought that quarterback would be a huge liability. The defense would be poor. Basically, sort of a, a carryover from 2020. That, those things could have been further from the truth, right? The defense was amazing, and Clifford was, was good to very good. And basically, the glue that even kept any of this together, and probably his injury is the reason that. Penn State's looking at seven and five versus uh, much, much better. So I was right, but for all the wrong reasons. And everyone thought that the running back room, everyone was oh. saying ad nauseum, oh, the best running back room that ever existed. Wow. That, that was obviously false. Um, Nonsense. Yeah. So, um, and obviously, you know, after the first few games, when Penn State came out, it was a totally different team than 2020. And I think what everyone expected, you got to recalibrate your expectations. So overall, it's a disappointment, even though I was closest to the number. <laughs> Things to look forward to. I mean, just like this year, uh, hopefully, hopefully I'm wrong again, next year looks like it's a rebuilding year um, with uh, presumably a new, a new quarterback, half the defense going to the NFL. Um, I don't see the help on the way on the offensive line, really, other than the Langdon Tanglewall and Salim Wormley, who was injured all year but would have started, Coach right. Franklin said. So maybe, you know, they need to hit – I think like the Mac schools and Conference USA schools and pick off their best offensive linemen, a la Epicetti on the defensive side, because you're not going to get a power five offensive lineman in the portal that's any good, generally. Uh, you got to find, find some, some kid from Akron that's like, hey, you want to play big time football one year of your life, maybe get looks, come, come play for us, and we, you will start right away. Trust us. Look at our, <laughs> look at our center. Um, so... Uh, hopefully, hit the portal hard again. Maybe they can put a respectful season together. I'm going to assume PJ Mustafer comes back. You get Adisa Isaac back off of injury. I think. I think one thing to look forward to is the defense is probably going to keep Penn State in every game next year. Obviously, you lose Ebiketti, which is sad. You lose Brisker, which is a big hit. The rest of the losses, I think, can be replaced fairly easily with backups. Brooks and Lucetta have decisions to make. I think those guys could go either way. Hmm. But you get one of those two back. And that's going to be a top 10 defense again. So that's one reason to be optimistic, I suppose. I had a viewer tell me before the season started that he doesn't feel like it's the year starting until you pick us to go 15 and 0. So I'm going to kind of let you off the hook for that because you just always predict that. Yeah, I, 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 talk about disappointment. I'm disappointed in the offensive coordinator. I thought, I thought the players would be more creative than what they were. I, I don't know. You know. They talked about going over under center. You talked about getting, getting that half a yard when it's fourth and one. I mean, Illinois got that every time. They it just just run up there. But I, I was just disappointed in his. Play you don't ball. crack thirty against an FBS opponent. You have to kind of call that a failure. Yeah, in that's your a fail. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but I'm optimistic for next year. I think. No kidding. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> just want to make your prediction right now. Yeah, they got you know they got a great recruiting. I got team a good feeling back. about his prediction. But, yes. but it, they're going to be fine next year. You're just. Get, get, get recruiting class? Yep. Sure. Yep. All right, Noble, you and I bit it hard. Yeah. We both, uh, you know, <laughs> d- drank the Kool-Aid instead of the tailgate red. And yeah. now we're drinking the tailgate red. I'm drinking water. 10 and 2, how are you feeling? 
I, I, I think I was, I was trying to be positive. Like I said, I really was going into the what season. A dummy. Who would pick us to go ten and two? I know. I know. Um, I, look, I hit my head a lot. Uh, and and <laughs> I really, I felt good coming in. I was in that kind of really. I was the opposite of Kevin. Like I was in the nine and three in my head. Yeah. But I was, yeah. you know what? Like ten wins. Like just let's lay it out there. New OC. You know, thought they would be better. I watched him at Ohio, at, at Oklahoma State. I watched his tape. Very good. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm really disappointed in this team. I'm disappointed that one guy getting hurt derailed the entire season. Yeah. You uh, feel like these are conditions where Penn State historically has won, has overcome absolutely. Because they yeah. needed to. Yeah. Penn State yeah. needed to win yes. this season, and we didn't. I I guess if I am looking for a positive, again, as somebody who thought this was going to be a good team, and it wasn't. It's I, that I, I do think for as poorly as the offense performed, there were some flashes from Mike Yersich. I expect year two to be, to be an improvement. Disappointment to me is that we still struggle to beat teams with inferior talent. Yeah. Michigan State's recruiting classes the last five years averaged number 32, according to 24-7. Penn State was 14, and Illinois was worse. Mm. So, on that lovely note, we're going to cut the break. We'll be back. Stay with us. My name is Scott Hilliker, and I am the winemaker here at Mount Nittany Vineyard and Winery. I've been here about six years, and I got into the wine business uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago. I started making wine in my basement and fell in love with the whole process of winemaking. I'd like to welcome you guys out to Mount Nittany Vineyard and Winery. I'm gonna show you around for a little while. Cool, I like it. Thank you very much. Awesome, let's All do right. it. Let's come on back, we'll take you back into the cellar. different wines that we make here and on these racks behind you um, are the different wines uh, that we make. Uh, we make dry whites and we make dry reds. We make sweet whites, we make sweet reds. We make uh, dry rosés and sweet washes. We make port style wine, we make fruit wines, we make everything in between. I think we have probably about 25 different wines that wow. we make here. Um, a lot of them have, we've been making since 1990, so we've been making them for about 30 years. That's crazy. So right now the vineyard's going through some replanting. We've, uh, the past couple years, we've been taking out some of the old vines that have been here that were uh, just not producing um, well. They had some, there were some age to them. Uh, but the new vines that we have put in right now, uh, there's about four different varieties that we have. This coming springtime, we're planting another variety, so we'll have five different varieties that we grow up here on the, on the mountain. Mm. 
This is our tailgate red. So this wine we've been making for a long, long time. Yeah. It's a really fruity wine. It's great for tailgating type uh, foods, hamburgers, hot dogs, <laughs> pizzas. Um, it's uh, one of our, it's, it's probably our best selling wine. It's a, um, an off dry wine as well. It's got a little bit of sweetness to it. Um, but it is a, um, it's a, it's a wine that we sell cases and cases of it this time of the year for football games. Alcohol is going to make an especially great pairing with this year's football team. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a winemaker, I come up and I walk around on the weekends and talk with people out here, uh, you know, interact with customers in the tasting room. And I, I'd like to hear what, what they yeah. have to say, the good and yeah, the bad, right. you know. Sure. Um, so that's some of the ways that we get feedback from uh, the people that are, are buying and drinking our wines. Good stuff. Uh, and went to school to become a winemaker and actually did one of my internships here at the uh, winery. And uh, that's how I got a job here. Once my internship was over, uh, they decided to offer me a job and I've been here ever since. And it's been a great place to work. It's a beautiful setting up here on the mountain. Uh, the, the people I work with are amazing and we have a really good group, a uh, good team here at the winery. Mike's normally a moonshine guy. Yeah. 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 He really yeah. likes to hit the still. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is good. We're trying to class him up. Mike's done. Appreciate that. Carrying yeah. a little brown jug around. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the obligatory PSU pregame show. We're wrapping up Penn State's underwhelming 2021 season, but we are here at Mount Nittany Vineyard and Winery. Happy to be here. I'm your fake host, Chris Bucanani. Happy to be here with the usual crew, Mailman, Kevin, and Brandon. And back for his second weekend is Greg Woodman, the author of Why Penn State, a book we really all enjoy on this show. And Greg, I will tell you what I like about this, and Kevin and I especially are suckers for the Penn State dopamine, as, as you like to say, is that this book is about the 1980s for Penn State as a football program, as a university, and kind of the intersection of football and higher ed, and how in that decade in particular, the synergy between those two things really came together beautifully. Mm -hmm. And it reminds us that football, for as much as we love it, exists to enhance the university as an institution, as a community, everything we love about Penn State and being Penn Staters and not the other way around, which is something that I kind of feel is starting to get lost in the ironically enough post-sanctions era discourse around Penn State football. That it's great to win, I love winning, we all get pissed off when we lose, but it's just one important, crucial part of the tableau that is Penn State. I think you really nailed it in this book. So, great holiday gift, you can go to whypennstate.com or get it in paperback on Amazon. There, I just did your plug for you, it's on the screen. Let's talk, thank you, thank you. Well, is there a question in there? Or Kevin, do you have a question about that before I, I, I wax philosophically about well, the I, 80s? I want to hear about the 80s. I, I was reminded of the 80s when we were, I was at Michigan State uh, and there was a pep rally. There's always a pep rally before the games and Sandy Barber usually attends. She spoke and she made the claim that uh, the best four years in a row in Penn State football history was 2016 through 2019. And as someone who was here and wrote about two national championships in the same decade, let alone the three undefeated seasons in a row in the 19-teens and the two in the early 1970s, I don't know, I just want to get your thoughts on, on that statement as someone who watched a lot of great football in the 1980s. Okay, well, I, well 1982 to 1986 is kind of the, the theme of this book and the political capital that the football program brought to the university. Mm -hmm. And in the book is the full speech that Joe Paterno gave to the trustees about if we can be number one in football, why can't we be the number one university? And correspondingly, fundraising started in the 80s because the state appropriations got cut. And so the convergence of our funding getting cut from the state, almost we had to become a kind of a private school mentality, we created a, Penn State created a fundraising department. That's why Bryce Jordan was hired. So the 80s, the whole book is about kind of how that created the foundation, the values, the culture, and at the core was a very aspirational, relatable brand. And as you said, Chris, uh, in a way that Penn State's in the business of education. We're in the, in the business of educating students. Mm -hmm. 
We have 700,000 plus alums who have been educated by this great university. In the 80s was the time where everything elevated. Everything <laughs> elevated. We almost mm -hmm. became a brand, almost Ivy League. I mean, our leadership at the time came out of the Ivy League. Paterna was the Ivy League. I even contend that you know, the, the Catholic school, prep school, you know, there, there's just a lot of essence. And you know, a brand lives in the hearts and minds of its audience. And the, the brand and lives in our hearts and minds. And so we have, I feel that decade was the foundational, I use the word cementing, kind of cemented uh, what lives in our hearts and minds. And we're 45 years later, and, and here we are, still educating students, still playing football. And, and you guys certainly talk a lot about the passion of our centricity, if you will, on wins and losses. You know, but I still look at kind of the quality of the student athlete and what their experience is here for four or five years and what they're getting out of it. It's a unique, wonderful spirit. It's why people watch this stupid TV show. It's why people love this guy. Uh, it's something we should take ownership of and be proud of and, and continue to carry forward into the future, update for the modern era. Look, we're gonna talk about James in, in the next segment and I'm happy he's back, truly. But contrast a guy winning his first national championship and going to the board and demanding more money on academics versus a guy losing 10 games in two years and demanding more money for facilities. It's a special thing, man. There is a spirit there that can be instructive and you can learn from and you can grow, grow from. And it doesn't involve pretending that Penn State football was invented in 2014. Yeah, I thought a lot about that speech to the board now th during this, the last few weeks of you know, begging for more money for bells and whistles. And to be clear, so I'm not criticizing. This is tough love, okay? Uh, I'm I, just, I'm well, just I, calling I it straight. I, I am. You, I know you, know you know are. But yeah, go uh, Google that speech. It's, it's published a few different places. Yeah. 80s, definitely the most important decade since the early 50s, Milton Eisenhower when Penn State became a university, in my, I think, based on your book especially. I've, I've learned a lot. Well, and, and the brand became a global brand. It was the kind of a good guy, you know, aspirational student athlete, athlete, do not exploit players. You know, they're here to lifelong learning. And it was really a family and a community. And, and it, it, beyond Penn State alums, I think the nation, you know, there was Notre Dame, and then there became Penn State. You know, it became a national brand. I'll give James credit. I think he has upheld the most important parts of that. WhyPennState.com, check it out. We'll be right back after this. Except for they actually won in the 80s. <laughs> Welcome back to the obligatory PSU pregame show. We are here at the Vintner's Loft, a lovely tasting area at the Mount Nittany Vineyard and Winery in State College. I'm your fake host, Chris Bucanani. I am joined by my three regular panelists, Kevin Horn, Brandon Noble, and the world famous Mike DeMille. Oh, wow, whatever. All right, well, this is gonna be a fun segment because mm -hmm. this is when we get to talk about the fact that James Franklin just got a 10-year contract extension, which if the internet is any indication, Penn State fans are feeling just super duper awesome. about off a seven and five result. So I feel like, Kev, you're the perfect option to open <laughs> the conversation. We need more than whatever we have, seven minutes, because <laughs> it's so complicated. I, I, it sure I, is. I went through all sorts, all the different stages of emotions yeah. this week after that happened, right? Because obviously the good part is you, you locked down a coach that uh, took you to three New Year's Six Bowls and won two of them for the long haul. And I do not want to be, I mean, you're, you're seeing what's happening in Oklahoma, you're seeing what's happening at LSU, all these SEC schools just want to go through their coaches every two or three years no matter what. That, I think, is not a sustainable model. And we're seeing that, I think, more coaches are taking long-term deals and more schools, other than the SEC, which are all insane and are gonna eat themselves alive, um, are, it, it's worth it. It's, wor it's generally worth it to have stability, mm -hmm. even if a guy underperforms every once in a while, okay? Um, now we've had two years. Penn State has not only underperformed, but significantly underperformed. And um, I don't, I, I find coach to be extremely, have an extremely annoying attitude about it all. That's what gets me, right? Because I think, Ultimately, you can't scoff at the record and the building up of the program that was almost totally dissolved. Right? You can't scoff at that. I will give him credit for that forever, but it's never his fault, right? And so that really annoys me, right? The last, we didn't start hearing about all these facilities issues that apparently Penn State has. Like, the most, it seems like people on Twitter think that Penn State's playing on like the Remember, remember the Titans <laughs> practice field, right? 
It's not true. No. I mean, well, it, it's gorgeous. And that's a whole other, yeah, that's a whole, well, the, the one in the movie, not the one they have now because of the movie money. But um, uh, <sighs> that's a whole other topic about the facilities, which we don't either here nor there. But the, the positive is like, I think he's a good coach. I think he's capable of winning a national championship here. We have him locked in. He's got the best recruiting class he's ever had. He's got the best recruiting class Penn State ever has. Stability is the name of the game. I don't want to find another coaching search. I don't want to keep rotating through these group of psychopaths. Um, the bad side is like, maybe he is a seven and five coach ultimately. Yeah. And, um, and he's annoying while doing it, extremely annoying while doing it. So it's a mix. And now we're stuck with, it's a very coach friendly contract because he can get out in three years basically. The buyout goes down to basically nothing in three or four years. He has 85 million guaranteed from Penn State. Um, so if we want to fire him in four years, we got to pay him the whole rest of the contract. Yep. So we're, we're sort of married to this guy for the next yeah. decade of my life. I'll be 40 by the time James Franklin leaves. And uh, that's kind of depressing, ultimately, because I really can't stand the guy, despite the fact I'm glad that he is our head coach. Really glad he's our head coach. I love, you, you I can't love even tear imagine that. Right down the middle of Kevin he can, when James Franklin. I mean, he, gets, he graduates the kids. The kids are graduating. They're staying out of trouble. Yeah. But uh, who would have thought, I mean, Losing 10 games in the last two years, you get a contract extension. I don't know. Only at Penn State. That baffles me. I did some research, Mike. Penn State is the only program, I think, in Power 5 college football that has never fired a coach for on-field performance. They've only fired one coach ever. I forget why. But it wasn't for on-field performance. Nice. They have only Penn State has never fired a coach for on-field performance. And they just gave the guy an extension for and losing. I like that. <laughs> When yeah. I'm talking about positives of all of this, mm -hmm. I like the fact that Penn State is not a place that runs coaches out of town, I, generally, I, I in any sport. Yep. And to your point, unbelievably, never for football. Never. Agreed. Like, that's really we remarkable. Had, we had a pretty unique experience here, though. So. Right. Yeah. But, but I like that. No, I me like too. the uniqueness. Yeah. And I like that to the extent that it was wild that Joe spent his entire career as a coach at Penn State, it equally defies convention in the modern world of college football that we've kept James Franklin here as long as we have and that we've locked him up. I mentioned earlier in the show that the average of our last five recruiting classes, at least by the 24-7 measure, is 14th in the nation. Now that compared unfavorably to losing to a team like Michigan State yes. or Illinois or, or some of the other teams we've lost to, but Penn State's never recruited at that level prior to having James Franklin here. That's I true. think it has not been fun to be a pro-Franklin media platform in the internet age, but I think we've all been generally supportive. And I, I kind of feel the same way Kevin does. I am happy that he's here. I am happy that we've doubled down on stability. And as I noted, Mike, I'm happy that this is a place that does things a little bit differently. Yeah. The most frustrating thing to me is I would just once like to see them come to the podium after a game like we saw on Saturday last week and just cop to it. Just take yeah. responsibility. Don't blame us. Don't blame the administration. Yeah. Don't blame the slightly less lavish facilities or the one or two million dollars less than we spend in Ohio yeah. State or Alabama. Yeah. Just say like, yeah, sorry. That like Tom Allen and Jim Harbaugh did, right? They said, hey, it's our fault. Yeah. Pay me less money. I promise you will get it there. And one of the two at least did. Um, but you know, winning cures everything. I liked the guy a lot when he was winning. Like when he, all his idiosyncrasies that, that bug the heck out of me now, the whininess, when he's winning, I am like, oh, that's our guy, look at him. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the X factor, obviously. That's, that's the same across the country. 30 seconds, go. I like that we locked him up. I think it's gonna help with recruiting. Uh, I hope he can keep the staff around that, that we need to keep. Yes. Player development is my big question with him and this staff. And over 10 years, we're going to figure it out. They haven't done a great job of that up until this point. They really haven't. That's why we lose football games to, to lesser opponents. To Iowa yeah. does a to great Iowa, job developing Michigan State. Michigan State. So to me, all right, look, 10 years, here you go. Develop away. We're going we're gonna to have a great idea as to whether or not these guys can actually coach football when this is all said and done. Well, continuing our tradition of doing a championship weekend show in which we are not playing for a conference championship we're gonna talk about the playoffs on the other side. James is here, enjoy it everybody, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Mike the Mailman. If you or your loved one or a friend has a gambling problem, don't hesitate to call the number below on the screen. They're there to help.
Hi everybody, Mike the Mailman with another edition of Trends to Treasure. This will be for the weekend of December 5th. There are no college trends this weekend, so we're going to stay with the NFL. First up, we have Baltimore at Pittsburgh. Baltimore has covered five of the last five games, so take the Baltimore Ravens. Next up, we have Denver at Kansas City. Kansas City has covered eight of the last 10 games, so the selection here would be the Kansas City Chiefs. Our third selection this weekend is Jacksonville at the LA Rams. The Rams have covered five of the last five games, so the play here is the Rams. Our bonus selection this week is San Francisco at Seattle. Seattle has covered 10 of the last 12 games, so the pick here will be the Seattle Seahawks. That's it for this week's Trends to Treasure. I'm Mike the Mailman, and don't forget, bet with your head and not with your heart. Go get them. Ten and two. <laughs> A uh, great run. Thank you. For the Trends to Treasure. Welcome back, everybody, to the obligatory PSU pregame show. Thanks so much to Mount Nittany Vineyard and Winery, which Mike the Mailman told me to make sure I clarify is in Center Hall. Very important. 99% of you do not know or care about because you call this whole area State College. But there you are. We appreciate them hosting us. It's been fun to come out here and hang out in the Vintner's Loft or Tasting Grotto, or whichever you prefer. <laughs> Thanks to the Nittany Lions not even sniffing the Big Ten Championship game. We do not have a score to predict no. here for random number generators, so I thought it would be fun, guys, mm -hmm. to speculate about what four schools are gonna have their name called on Sunday as the participants in the 2021 playoff. And I'm actually gonna change it up. I'm gonna go first. Nice. So I think there's a bit of a dilemma for the committee this year, because Cincinnati, Mike, who I know you love, is a group of five school. And they are hell-bound, motivated to keep a group of five school out of this process. But I think Cincinnati is gonna do them a major favor. I don't wanna see it happen, but I've got Houston winning the AAC championship game and getting the committee off the hook. My four playoff teams are gonna be Michigan beating Iowa, Georgia winning the SEC title, Alabama getting in with two losses, Who? and Oklahoma State by virtue of playing in a conference title game and coming off a win versus Oklahoma, jumping the fighting Irish. So I think you're going to see those four teams. But the scenario I'm rooting for is one that sees Baylor winning, Cincinnati losing, and two SEC teams getting in. So you've got, or no, I'm sorry, Cincinnati winning. And so you've got Bama, Georgia, Cincy, Notre Dame, four teams, one Power Five conference. That's what I'm rooting for. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? Right. Chaos. chaos. That's the chaos. The absolute theory. chaos. Yeah. Okay. Who you got? Uh, I, I sort of agree. I mean, uh, Cincinnati's 10.5-point favorites at home against Houston in the championship game here. Well, Houston's playing pretty well. I mean, they, they, they could lose that game, but it's pretty well prescribed, right? The only team that's guaranteed to be in at this point in time is Georgia because if they lose, they're still going to be Alabama. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, and they in. should be. Yeah. Absolutely. I think Cincinnati's, their Cincinnati's now definitely in if they win. That was not the case when the rankings first came out. Everyone, some people were sort of mad. They were five or six behind Bama. And other one-loss teams, now, the, with the way that the, it's been played out, Cincinnati's in if you they win the this weekend. You think the head over Notre Dame keeps them in the top four oh, yeah. if they win? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and just the way every other team has played. Sure. Right? Um, the one thing I disagree with is I think the way this committee acts and the way that the recency bias plays in, I think Alabama played themselves out of a playoff spot by having to go to triple overtime against Auburn. Right, unless they beat Georgia, obviously. If they beat Georgia, they're yeah. obviously right. in. Right, sure. But um, but I think that close game against Auburn, who has been on a big skid, they they may actually stink. Um, really, really hurt them in their two loss prospects mm -hmm. as well. It should. You look at their schedule. Their schedule was not good this year. The SEC was down this year, and Alabama played some of the worst teams, and they had no out of conference. And they uh, played poorly teams. against Florida, yeah, LSU, poorly. and Auburn. Yep. Sure. The Texas Texas A and M lost L the six and six LSU. Like yep. one of their uh, their, their loss looks a lot worse. So I think Notre I think one lost Notre Dame who doesn't play and doesn't control their own destiny right now um, gets in over over two loss Alabama. Right. So I think Oklahoma State's in if they win. 
Uh, and I think Notre Dame is in if Georgia wins. Okay. Well, I, you have to have a few things go the wrong because yeah. Michigan's in if they win too. So sure. Michigan controls their own destiny, I think. Oklahoma, Over Oklahoma State. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's what, I, that's what I meant. So Georgia is in no matter what. Michigan controls their own destiny. Cincinnati controls their own destiny. And then that fourth spot, Notre Dame needs Oklahoma State to lose and Alabama to lose. I, I, although, you know, the committee loves Notre Dame like they love Alabama, but I think Oklahoma State will, will, will be in other. I like Georgia, Cincinnati, Michigan, and I would think Oklahoma State. That's what I'm thinking. That's the most likely. If it, if it goes chalk, that's a guarantee. Yep, I think that's it. Yeah. I have Georgia, Michigan, Cincinnati, and I think Notre Dame. Whether I, I think Oklahoma State crazy, loses, I think I think Oklahoma State doesn't go because of brand. Uh, that's that is a I fair think, point. I think that that, a, I think Notre that, Dame's brand versus yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Big Twelve yes. and Oklahoma State's brand. Yeah, it's a, to me it's a question and of and that what, pains me right like that's like a dagger through the heart. It's a question of to what degree is the committee going to punish Notre Dame for not being at a conference. Right. The conference title games only matter when they decide they matter. Yeah. Yeah. So it's up to the committee whether they matter this year for the Big 12. But boys, I, look, screw Michigan. It seems to me that fate is not without a sense of irony because after all the Dermon Strang about faking injuries and hating the Iowa fans and the back and forth on Twitter, I'm a Hawkeyes fan this week. Hey. Go Iowa, beat Michigan. Hail to the victor.